we are prepared to, as far as I can see. So I would like to welcome all of you for this session of our Monday seminar. Uh, and I welcome those who are in Prague or who watch us at a distance. And uh, I would like to ask Dushan Varish to start his talk. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you everyone for uh, coming to see this lesson, uh, like a lecture where I will be talking about transformers and mainly about their uh, relation to the training process and their training process. So as motivation examples, uh, we probably, most of you have heard that uh, some of the state-of-the-art transformer-based networks are rich in human-like performance, for example, in machine translation or text generation, but they are still far from perfect, uh, as we can see in the example in box where uh, GPT, the uh, sentence generator, is uh, prompted by a sentence or string seed, which is supposed to give some uh, start uh, from, from, which, uh, for, for, from which it should start generating some text. So in the seed, there's a mention of some herd of unicorns, but in the generated example, the transformer or the GPT incorrectly assumes that the unicorns uh, are four-horned four -horn creatures, so it obviously doesn't understand the concept of unicorn. Uh, so although these networks are inspired originally by uh, biological neurons, they are still far from uh, mimicking the biological learning. Usually these models also, although they are strong, they are very narrowly specialized. Even the, the models based on GPT, they are fine-tuned to specific tasks. Uh, they, they require huge amounts of training examples, which is not uh, specific for humans. And they, it's, it's discutable whether they can uh, efficiently exploit the previously learned uh, knowledge. So I will be talking about three topics. First, the generalization in context of NLP, then uh, the topic of catastrophic forgetting. And last, I will talk some, something about uh, modularity and knowledge composition. So first, the generalization. So we know the term from the machine learning. Uh, basically, when we are training the model or, or evaluating the model, uh, we split the available data to train, development, and test data sets. Hopefully, they, we, we do it in a way that they have similar distribution. So we are not training the model on a news task and, and evaluating it on, on medical domain, because that, that would uh, bias our evaluation. And you're probably also familiar with, the, with this uh, graph or, or plot where we do not want the model that memorizes the data. We want a model that extracts uh, interesting features or structure of the data and can apply it to novel examples. So speaking about novel examples, in the context of NLP, how do we define novel instances? So if we take, uh, for example, some classification tasks, the novel examples are, are just new instances that are not present in our data. But when we are working with uh, language, uh, this might be a little bit uh, fuzzy definition. For example, uh, we have ambiguities in language. So if we want to translate a sentence, an example, I saw a man with a telescope, uh, there are multiple translations, which are usually based on the context. And it can be also difficult for a human to correctly evaluate whether the model translated the sentence correctly. It might be that the translation or one of the possible translation is correct, but it doesn't mean that the model generalizes well if, if the translation it provided is similar to the one present in the, in the training data. The more uh, the bigger problem is when we uh, have to consider the uh, data overlap and in, in the overlap in our data. So for example, we can have two sentences that are almost identical and differ only in one word. And if we want to translate them or uh, do a part of speech tagging and evaluate the generalization on the test sentence, it may be that the uh, result is almost perfect and the only error is in the, uh, dif the difference between the sentence. Like the, the only mislabeled word might be the dog, but we still get a high accuracy of our model. 
And if we are not aware of these uh, overlaps, we might get an overestimation of, of the model performance. So recently there have been some proposals how to counter this. Uh, for example, we can split our data multiple times and repeat the training and evaluation. And uh, more recently, they also, uh, the, the authors of the second paper suggest that we should also consider some adversarial split, splits, which uh, create uh, example, test examples that should trick or, or be more difficult for our model to, to process. So uh, to give some examples, uh, I think the, the most uh, interesting example is the, the state-of-the-art GPT language generator, uh, language generator. This model was trained on billions of training tokens, but also has a huge number of uh, uh, model weights. So the concern about overfitting is quite uh, reasonable in this case. And we, we still are analyzing, or the NLP community is still analyzing what are its limits and what, what it can do. So for example, by design, we know that this model has no internal memory. It can be simulated, uh, for example, in chatbots on, or similar uh, cases by presenting the model with a previous conversation or the conversation so far, which can be the seed for the uh, model to generate a next response. Or another example, as, as seen on the slide, there's been a text-based RPG based on this model, where the model is taking the answers from the player uh, describing the situation and waiting for for the player prompts, but it can be easily tricked because if we can we can see in the example that the model is talking about a sleeping sleeping dragon on the treasure, but the player uh, tricks the model by telling him that he loses the treasure from uh, underneath the dragon, and the model forgets that the dragon was actually alive when when it introduced it, introduced him. Another question is whether these models can do some basic arithmetics. Uh, Brown et al. In, in their original paper about the GPT-3 uh, were mm, arguing that they can, uh, that the model can do some basic uh, arithmetics with two-digit numbers. But if we consider how many combination of two-digit two, two number addition uh, equations uh, can, are there, uh, that uh, it, it, we, we can argue that, that the model just memorizes addition tables and does not do actual addition or multiplication. Uh, another uh, recent uh, mo model or adaptation of the GPT is uh, training uh, the GPT or fine tuning it on the text of philosophers, famous philosophers. And uh, the argument of the, of the researchers is that this model can actually, well, it can actually mimic the, the philosophers. The, the question is whether it can actually reason. So one example from, from the, their website is asking the model about his uh, quest, uh, about his opinion on killing animals. And again, the model gives an interesting answer, consider, consider some ethical, uh, ethical uh, aspects of this question. But we can argue that uh, this question can probably in some form appear in our training data. So the model is maybe just mimicking what the philosopher would say and is not doing any reasoning. So we would like to uh, analyze this model uh, and the clearer the, the result of our analysis, the better. So how, how can we do it? Uh, our, our suggestion is to uh, start uh, analyzing the models on, on the simpler tasks. So for example, in vision or, or the, uh, yeah, in, in the computer vision, uh, when they are developing architectures or models, they usually test them on MNIST, which is just a simple uh, number labeling uh, task. So in, in case of NLP or sequence to sequence, it would be good to have similar tasks. So we suggest uh, training the models and analyzing them on some simple string editing tasks. The, the great thing about that is that there are, there are no ambiguities in, in string editing. Like if we have an operation which is well-defined and the input example, there's only one clear answer. Uh, so, and also we, we as humans can, can easily learn how to solve these tasks without seeing much examples. So, so we as humans are quite a high baseline for this. So here are some examples of input and output we, we tried out with our model. So uh, the question is, 
if the model can actually uh, generalize on these tasks in some way, it should probably be able to generalize to instances, instances of length that are different than the lengths present in our training data. So how, how did we set up the experiment? We generate a set of unit sequences in our case, sequences from, from zero length to, to length 20. Then we split this data uh, to buckets according to the length. Uh, so we have length uh, zero to 10, then 11 to 15 and 16 to 20. Uh, we also take the 15 bucket or the 11 uh, to 15 bucket and split the train development and test set. Uh, so there are, there's again, no overlap even within the bucket. And uh, then we add labels uh, to, 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 this, uh, to, to, to these sequences. And they, they can repeat for, for different tasks. We just want to evaluate the model uh, and how, how, they, how it solves uh, each of the tasks. Uh, so we use a simple net transformer network only with uh, one, one uh, depth one and single attention head just to make the analysis more easier. And we want to also, also want to have a, a simplest model that can still solve these tasks. And we, for evaluation, we just uh, evaluate accuracy based on the exact string match. So what are the results? Uh, basically, the model can learn perfectly uh, to perfectly solve the task if they are in the same length domain as the training data. And again, like these are the uh, test instances that are not present in the training data. So, so there is some general, generalization happening. Uh, we, uh, except for the, for the reverse task where, they are, where there is some error rate and we, we did not focus on uh, like what, what are the reasons for this, but the main point is that when we present the model with uh, sequences that are longer or shorter than the ones present in our training data, the, the accuracy drops significantly. Even for the shortened sentence sentences, uh, the, the uh, not zero accuracy can be attributed to uh, some sequences being close to training sequences and, and just some the, 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 the hits or, or the correctly uh, generated answers might be just a coincidence or, or something like that. So it's nice that we've detected this problem with uh, the toy tasks, but the question is how, how, how does the transform model behave with respect to length on some NLP task? So we repeated the uh, experiments with machine translation, we used a much larger model, uh, not the state of the art size, but uh, quite large for, for, for our uh, purpose, for the purpose of analyzing uh, the, this, this issue. Uh, we split, uh, we did the tokenization of the data and based on the number of tokens, we split the training and test data to buckets according to the length. Uh, and uh, if we look at the results, we can see that the performance, uh, okay, first I will explain, uh, since we are uh, comparing the models on the validation buckets of different lengths, uh, these are not directly comparable by blood. So only thing we can really directly compare is the uh, uh, order of, of uh, the, the performance within each column or each bucket, because that's the same uh, validation data set. But we can still see that the model performs best in, in the, when, when the, the length of the training data and the validation data matches. And the performance drops uh, quite, uh, not, not linearly in, in this case, but the, the, the closer the domain of the training data is to the, to the validation data, the higher the performance. So there, there, this suggests that there is some overfitting happening. Uh, we also present the uh, results of the model trained on the full chain, which is obviously higher because this model is more general. Uh, so uh, we will also look what might be a reason be, uh, behind the uh, performance drop in these models. And it seems that the model uh, tend, the models tend to uh, generate a hypothesis uh, of the similar length as, as, as the hypothesis or the references in the training data. 
So this is another uh, proof or proof that suggests that the, the overfitting to length is, is a potential issue. Uh, so even though it's an issue, there's a question whether we can take advantage of it. So we also ran, ran a separate experiment where we took the, the 10 buckets, 20 and 30 bucket, and for each of these buckets respectively, we did a concatenation of the, of the training examples to create uh, an artificial 60 bucket. So basically we have now three artificial data set and the original 60 bucket that data sets that, that all contains the sentences of length 51 to 60. And we trained the uh, separate models for, for each of, of these data sets and evaluated them in a similar way. And we can see that, that this uh, overfitting issue holds even for artificial data. Uh, only the 10 bucket uh, performs uh, worse. And this might be maybe we, we are still investigating why, why what, what is the reason behind this. It might be because that uh, concatenating more than, let's say, three or four examples uh, actually has a negative effect on, on the model training. But the good news is that there is a potential, and if we want to train models that, that process uh, longer sequences, and we don't have data for that, uh, we might uh, try this method to augment our data. So that was uh, the <laughs> that was the, that was the generalization in NLP, and now I will talk about catastrophic forgetting. So, uh, in theory, uh, if we want to build a general AI system, we expected that it would be updated continuously because, uh, well, uh, we don't have all the data available at the same time, and that that's why we need to to, to update it incrementally. Uh, also, when compared to human learning, we also when humans approach new tasks, they also they already have some prior knowledge that they, they explore when learning new tasks. So deep networks uh, usually suffer from catastrophic forgetting. This was already this this uh, issue is, has been known for several decades. And what happens when training a network on a new task? Uh, the original weights, the weights that are optimal for the previous tasks are not uh, considered at all during the training and they are basically overwritten by the uh, new tasks during the learning of the new task. So we also want to check this issue with, with regards with our core uh, string editing task. So we have uh, several uh, different uh, edit operations and we learn them in, the in a sequence. Uh, again, we only train them on the 15 buckets. So sequences from, from length 11 to length 15. Uh, we fix the number of training epochs for simplicity. And we also compare them to the, join, uh, to the, to the model that's trained jointly of all the tasks together, just to see whether uh, the model actually has the capacity to be able to learn all these tasks together. So in the table, we can see, uh, so the each line presents a performance of the model trained on the task and the task before that. The, the, the arrow shows the order of training. And obviously the catastrophic forgetting is there because the only good, the, the, the perform, the, model trained for a specific task only performs on that task and completely forgets the previously uh, learned tasks. So what can be doable? There were several methods suggested uh, for countering the catastrophic forgetting. So first uh, approach is uh, regularization based on regularizing the model weights. And this is not the standard L2 regularization we know from, from other machine learning uh, approaches. This is a per, very, per weight regularization. And the uh, motivation behind it is that the, it uh, basically originates from the model on neural network pruning literature, which showed that uh, most of the trained optimized models uh, can be pruned quite drastically. Usually even 90% of the weights can be discarded and or, or nullified and the model still performs quite well. 
So that means that there are some ways that are important for the learned tasks, and there are some ways that, that are completely irrelevant. And if we, uh, and, and the regularization based methods focus on this by introducing a regularization term that uh, this, uh, that motivates the model to update the ways that are not important for the previous learned tasks. So another possible approach is, uh, let's say, adapter-based method, uh, which is uh, the currently go-to method with the uh, GPT or the Baird Light models. So we take a huge network, uh, learned or trained on, on a huge amount of general data. So in case of Baird language modeling, uh, in the machine translation it might be some general domain translation and we freeze the network weights so they cannot be updated and we add an additional layer. In case of, of BERT, uh, if we, for, for example, want to adapt it to part of speech tagging, we add, we add an additional classification layer on top of the model. In case of MT, uh, there's been recent work uh, suggesting added, adding uh, an adapter or a, uh, feed forward layer after each uh, transformer layer that will learn uh, domain specific uh, uh, weights. So the third method, and um, this, this, this is quite a novel and, and from, from what I've uh, been checking out, uh, it might be quite a pain to implement. Uh, so the, the, this method is based on, on a replay. And the idea is that instead of, of jointly training model on all the available tasks, we learn the tasks uh, incrementally, but the previously learned task, we, we, for the previously learned tasks, we keep a small sample of training examples to kind of refresh the memory of the model after, after a certain period. And in, there's, there have been also su suggestion of not keeping samples from the previous task, but instead having a separate network that learns how to generate similar examples from the previous task and use them for, for a replay, which, which is useful because we don't need to keep the previous, uh, the, the data for the previous tasks. So in our case, we, we focused mainly on the LSD grid consolidation, which is the regularization based network. Uh, so in the figure below, you can see that when we are learning two tasks, usually they have some uh, area of optimal weights and based on the joint or experience with the joint learning, we can assume that there is also a, the, an overlap of these areas where there are ways that are optimal or almost optimal for both tasks. We would, when, when training the network to learn the task B and not forget the task A, you would like to uh, move towards that uh, uh, optimum overlap. But usually without any regularization, we move to, towards the optimum only for the new task. So nice thing about the elastic weight consolidation that is that it has a nice uh, Bayesian motivation or motivation in Bayesian uh, statistics. So let's assume that we have two data sets, uh, one for, for each task. So if we assume the joint learning, uh, that is just uh, finding a most probable or finding a set of parameters, parameters that is most probably given the, the available data. But in the context of joint learning, uh, we do the same, but uh, we do not only optimize the uh, likelihood of the data for tasks B given the, the network parameters, but we also want to consider the probability or, or the posterior probability of the parameters given the original task A. So the quick key question is that, that since we are uh, updating the weights theta during the training, uh, how do we compute the, the probability, the, the posterior probability uh, for the original task? We do not have the original weights, so and, and it would be quite costly. So to solve this, uh, the authors in the original paper suggest uh, estimating it through a multivariate Gaussian. And basically, the mean of the Gaussian is the values of at the end of the task A. And the variance of, of these Gaussians is a diagonal Fisher information, diagonal of the Fisher information matrix. So what is Fisher information? Fisher information uh, 
is uh, what was, was created, I think it came up in uh, information theory. Uh, it has some, some nice properties. For example, they, it's, it's quite a good estimate of the second derivation of the, of the function of, of the Gaussian near the local extrema. Why do we need second derivation? Because we want to identify which uh, weights are uh, weak or not weak, uh, sensitive to updates with respect to the original task. Those weights should not be updated at all or only a little bit. Otherwise, we would uh, our performance of the original task or task A would drop significantly. So that's that's what the second derivation actually tells us. The great thing is that the, the Fisher information can actually estimate the second derivation just from the first derivations, and it is positive semi-defined, which is great because we want to use this uh, Fisher information matrix in a, as a regularization part of a regularization term. So uh, down below is an equation, equation uh, that incorporates this uh, regularization term. So basically based on the uh, gradients of uh, the weights with respect to the original task, we can uh, regularize each weight with their, its own regularization term. So uh, it, we asked a different question in the original paper, they, they usually constrain the whole network uh, when, when, during the incremental, incremental learning. In our case, we, we wanted to know whether we can just pre-train parts of the networks. Because uh, for example, in machine translation, uh, we have an encoder-decoder architecture. And the decoder is basically a conditional language model. And technically, even the encoder can be uh, defined as a language model. So in our case, we want to first pre-train language models for each uh, side of the translation for the source side and target side, and then apply this regularization during the fine tuning on machine translation, mainly the low resource machine translation to avoid overfitting, which uh, happens quite a lot in the low resource MT. Uh, so we evaluated this on the IWSLT uh, Basque to English translation task. Uh, there is less than million, million sentence pairs, which already can be assumed low resource. It's not extremely low resource, but we, we, we thought that it should be good enough for, for these purposes. And we use the transformer model quite standard uh, with 16 attention heads. So, yeah. The thing about the uh, language models we used in the pre-training, they are all uh, left to write uh, transformer decoders. Uh, at the time we were doing the experiments, the BERT was only being released. So we didn't uh, assume that as an option, but we, I will talk later that about, about BERT and how it can be applied. Uh, we uh, optimize this model using cross entropy on, on our monolingual data. And to estimate the Fisher information, we compute the derivation uh, or the gradients on the, on the development set present in our uh, bilingual IWCFP development data set. Um, okay. So we also compare this uh, suggested system with the baseline transformer and the transformer that is trained on the training data and the back translated monolingual data. And there was also a suggestion of using a language model uh, objective for regularization instead of, uh, of a weight-based regularization term. So that is the third, third system we, we are comparing ourselves to. So as we can see, uh, the back, back translated uh, the, the model that was using back translated data dominates uh, everything, which is quite sad. Um, and another interesting thing is that uh, when we are only regularizing the source side or the encoder, or when we are uh, regularizing the whole model, the performance drops quite significantly, uh, which uh, we think that this might be because the incompatibility between the encoder pre-training and uh, the encoder role during the machine translation. 
because during pre-training, we only consider the left context of each word, but uh, in machine translation, during machine translation, the encoder actually uh, considers both right and, and left uh, context of each word. So it, it, it might be regularized too much. We have a slight improvement on, on target size regularization, but uh, yeah, it's not, not uh, that, that significant. So as I was saying, uh, we, we, are, we are suspicious about uh, incompatibility between the encoder, uh, the left to right uh, language model used for encoder pre-training -pre and the encoder role during MT. So we looked at the performance of the model and then we only pre-trained uh, encoder of a certain depth and the rest of the encoder was randomly initialized and not regularized. And you can see the, the more uh, deep in the, the encoder, the, the deeper the pre-trained encoder is, the lower the performance. So, so this, this is another support for the claim about the incompatibility of the encoder pre-training. So that was, uh, that were, those were our experiments with, with uh, catastrophic forgetting. And the last topic I would like to talk about is the modularity and how can we compo com compose uh, the previously learned knowledge. So again, the, the motivation is based on, on some previous works in, in linguistics and some, some in uh, cognitive science. Uh, you are probably familiar with the, with the quote from Noam Chomsky that he, where he suggests that humans can actually create novel uh, sentence examples with, with only a limited set of rules and a vocabulary. Uh, so current networks, they do uh, perform some sort of composition, but it's, it's uh, I would say it's some sort of a soft composition because uh, at every time, uh, and input is processed, the whole network is being executed and only, uh, and usually only some sort of a combination mechanism for, for multiple modules is being deployed. So ideally, we would like to have a network that chooses which parts of it should be executed for a, for a given example. And uh, basically, uh, the closest we, we had so far and was proven to be working in MT was the adapter adapter based approach where we can manually uh, swap the domain specific or language specific adapters in, in the network. But still, it is uh, human uh, coordinated and the network itself doesn't choose which adapter should be chosen. So to see uh, whether the vanilla transformer can do some uh, uh, knowledge composition. We made the, we redefined the original string edited task. Uh, we chose only two uh, string edit, edit operations, the copy and the reverse. And for each, we include a binary flag that uh, should tell the, uh, the, the model whether the task should be performed or not because while we can do copying or reversing of the same set sequence, we can, uh, oh, while, while we can do reversing or flipping of the characters in the sequence, we can also perform both tasks at once. So here's some description how, how, how we define these tasks and, and the examples of, of inputs and outputs. Uh, what is notable is that by setting both flags to zero, we are performing just a simple copy of the input to the output. And what we want to test is whether when we learned the copy uh, or the flip and the reverse task separately, right? whether we can also, whether, whether the network can also figure out how to solve the uh, combination of these two uh, operations. So here's some, uh, the, this, this plot shows the uh, validation accuracy, accuracy during the training of the model. So we can see that the copy and the flip, uh, these tasks are quite simple and the, and the model uh, learns them uh, quite quickly. Uh, it has quite a problem with the reverse task. Uh, I'm not sure whether I, whether I mentioned it, but the most importantly, 
the, these tasks are trained jointly. So we, while we are still learning reverse, we've already learned copy and flip. And uh, based on the lower uh, curve or the line, we can see that nowhere during the whole training, the network learned how to properly combine the task of flipping the, the symbols and, and reversing the set sequence at the same time, which is uh, definitely, there, there's a, quite a huge room for improvement of this. So next uh, slide. So, so the question is whether we can actually modularize networks so that the network has some mechanism to choose which parts should be executed and which parts should, should not be executed given the current example. Because in the current transformer, the only way how, how the network can distinguish the tasks being processed, like in the, in the previous example, the, the only way the networks can actually control the, the, the flow or how, what output should be produced for current input is by encoding, encoding the, the flag above, that informs the network which task is uh, supposed to be solved at, the, at, at the a certain moment. And yeah, there's no other mechanism to, to actually control it. So there, there, there was some, some work a uh, few years ago that suggested the uh, modularization of, of the current network ar architectures. And we wanted to apply this previous work on the multi-head attention since uh, there have been some previous work suggesting that the multi-head attention first special, some of the head attention heads in the multi-head attention specializes. Uh, there have been some reports that some, some attention heads uh, do manifest behavior, syntax-like behavior. Uh, some other heads focus on, on only the previous token, so, so that they learn to focus on, on the relative uh, distance between the tokens. Uh, other works have shown that um, some after, after the training is finished, a uh, uh, significant number of attention heads can be pruned without a significant drop in performance. So that means that at the end of training, we have some attention heads that uh, have some potential uh, to the back that the model has some capacity that is not being used. And we would like to uh, solve this or use this wasted capacity, right? Uh, so that's that, that why we focused on modularizing the attention. So just to recap, the, the multi-head attention is basically a summation or one, one interpretation or definition can be a summation of multiple single head attentions, where the single head attention is usually some scaled up product. The second equation is not that important in our case. Uh, and we can sort of redefine the multi head attention by adding masks. And we can, by, by adding this mask variable, we can uh, either manually, or let's say for, for starters, manually uh, say which attention heads should be used uh, during uh, training or, or validation. So the, the mask variable, as I said uh, uh, earlier, uh, can be either fixed or set uh, manually uh, by, by the researcher, or, or we can actually try to predict what is the best combination of mask variables, and therefore best combination of attention heads given the input and so example. Uh, this can be done by taking the standard uh, model probability, which is on the left side of the equation, and factorizing it by introducing a hid hidden variable A. The variable A should be uh, representing the subset of attention heads that are actually being used to process the, the given input. Um, so the, the obvious problem is that the number of combinations is quite large and uh, actually evaluating the whole summation is uh, computationally intractable. So in practice, uh, okay, yeah, I, I will come back to that a uh, bit later on. First, I will show you how the, the schema of the implementation 
So on the left side is a standard uh, transformer, let's say encoder in this case, but it's similar for the decoder. Uh, we have the beneath the feed for a layer that's the multi head attention layer, and we include a controller subnetwork which takes the input sequence, in our case, the unprocessed input, so basically embedded words, and produces or tries to predict the best uh, sub, uh, subset of attention heads that should be used to process the input. On the right side, we have an example of the controller. So since we are uh, processing the sequences of uh, various lengths, we need to first uh, do an average pooling to get a single vector. And then we applied uh, multiple uh, feed forward layers with the uh, rel and dropout. At the end is a softmax layer that predicts the, the correct uh, subset or the subset that should be used, subset of heads. So as I said before, the problem is that some sum is uh, intractable in practice. So uh, this can be uh, kind of avoided or the problem of summing over all possible subsets can be avoided by using expectation maximization algorithm. So in expectation steps, uh, step, we try to sample uh, multiple possible combinations and compute their loss with respect to the output. And we pick the single combination or, or the subset uh, that, that uh, has the lowest loss with the current training example. Then in the maximization step, we actually uh, take this uh, loss of this specific example, or no, specific example, the loss with respect to, to, to the chosen uh, module subset and use it for, for the model update by computing the gradient. So uh, one the question is whether we need to use, uh, do the expectation step uh, ex yeah, in every batch. Uh, since it is quite costly, we need to compute loss for multiple uh, network executions. So usually we perform the expectation steps only every n batches. And we store the best uh, module combination so far for the maximization step. So in our experiments, uh, we were focusing for the IW, uh, we are using the IWSL, IWSLP for training data, and we were evaluating our models on the IW17 uh, uh, test sets that are present in the Sucker uh, uh, evaluation framework. And the most important thing regarding the model setting is that we used eight attention heads and we tried uh, the, to pick subset of different sizes and compare them. And the uh, important thing that we noticed in our experiments uh, is that during the model warm up, uh, we should train the whole model without uh, picking uh, attention head subsets. We should pick all the attention heads. Otherwise, there's a chance of the model not converging at all. So, uh, okay. So here are the results of our experiments. So we experimented with the maximization step frequency of one and five. So we were, or oh, expectation step frequency of one and five. So we were either doing the expectation step every batch or we were applying it only every fifth batch. We were also uh, trying to only uh, pick the attention heads only in the encoder or decoder or both. And we tried the subsets of different sizes. So quite interestingly, even the uh, model that only picks a single attention head per layer in decoder performs on, on par with the baseline that uses all the attention heads. And we have even some slight improvements with the, where we can pick uh, the subsets of four attention heads out of eight. So, uh, the results on the one head uh, setting is quite suspicious because that suggests that uh, there are, from the very beginning, there might be, uh, the model might be way too strong in the first place. So we also perform experiments where we uh, picked a random subset of heads 
and fixed it for the whole training and validation. So uh, basically we were only using a single head per layer and, and the same head per each, in each layer during the whole training and evaluation. And we can see that even with the fixed head, the model performs quite well. Uh, on the other hand, when we pick a subset of four heads, th th this is not very good for the training as, as we can see on the, on the uh, performance drop with the, the fixed heads. We also tried out uh, how the model would behave if we had the perfect controller network, since the, the controller network predictions can also be faulty. So we did something like a Oracle head prediction by uh, doing the loss estimation uh, for all the possible head combinations for each example uh, using the reference translations. And we picked the head combination for the example that, that had the lowest loss because that's what we tried to do during training and use this uh, ideal head combination to process the validation example. So we can see that with, with the four head uh, system, we get some improvement over the baseline, no, even over the non-Oracle system, which suggests that, that there is a room for improvement in our control, also in our control network. Uh, still, uh, we were quite suspicious about uh, whether there is a module collapse ha happening during training. So module collapse is basically when the network starts preferring some heads over the others. And therefore these heads are updated more often and get even more advantage over the less updated heads, uh, which we, we get got this suspicion when looking at the single, single head uh, uh, fixed training. So the authors in the original modular uh, networks paper suggest, uh, say or argue that their approach should uh, actively handle the module collapse, but we still uh, looked at some statistics uh, during our training. So in this case, we looked at the training of our single head model. And for each training example, we also uh, took a note uh, which attention head was used to process uh, that example. And we've seen some interesting correlation. Uh, so basically after we trained the model, we tried to evaluate its performance on the validation data using each, uh, by fixing uh, the attention heads. But we, we evaluated, like, to, to give a better example, we. We have eight options, right? Because we have eight, eight heads to choose from. And we first evaluate, uh, translated our validation data using the first head, then the second head, then the third head. And we got the scores for each of the heads. And we also looked at the number of times the head was picked during the training for the maximization steps, uh, which resulted in the following scatter plot. And we can see that there is some correlation between the exposure of a head and the overall uh, performance of the model using only that single head. So that is a problem that, that needs to be solved in the future because of this, uh, this leads to uh, imbalance training. So to give some final remarks uh, regarding this talk today, uh, today's talk, the most interesting issue is probably the overfitting on the sequ sequence lengths, uh, although there is a chance that we might be able to exploit it in the future to, to, uh, by augmenting our data artificially. And this has to be uh, explored in more depth in the future. Another thing we've learned, uh, or at least I've learned during these experiments is that the uh, composition or the incremental learning in transformers is much more difficult or implementing it is much more difficult than in the uh, toy examples on NIST or the classifications where the most of the related work is has been done so far. So bridging the gap between the, the simple data classification of this data sets and the application in uh, real NLP tasks and models is quite huge. And uh, similar applies for, for the knowledge composition 
uh, like we still don't know whether uh, we can just apply the composition F, F, as I was show, showing uh, before with the, with the modularized attention or whether we actually need to redesign the network in a more sophisticated way to actually achieve the knowledge composition. Uh, another argument is whether some tasks actually can be decomposed to simple tasks, simpler tasks. So this, this is another thing that needs to be considered. And the one last thing I forgot to mention is that uh, oh, that's, that's, that's the thing we can, we can uh, leave for the discussion. This basically uh, analysis why uh, the performance with the modularized attention wasn't that, that good, but uh, yeah, I'll leave it for, 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 the, for the discussion. So thank you for your attention and please, I'm looking forward for the questions. Well, 